This is NHTV Election Live with Ken Bennett and Teal Caliendo. Now, Ken Bennett. Hello, and welcome to 2012, the big one, the election at all levels this year. I'm Ken Bennett, and uh, reunited with Teal Caliendo. Good evening. I, I, we were wondering when it was finally going to come, but today is the day. And joining us in the studio, two people who not only know politics, but uh, they live it, they breathe it, and they've experienced it at, uh, in so many extraordinary ways. Welcome back in your capacities as commentators rather than candidates. Michael Frieda, first selectman for North Haven. Walt Spader, Democratic town chairman. And uh, do you think you guys ever run against each other? <laughs> We did that once. <laughs> you did. Well, you never know. There could be another uh, another go around. It maybe next year. Next, you never know. We'll see what happens, Ken. Mm -hmm. But it's great to be here. It's nice to be here with yeah. you and Teal and Walter, and uh, looking forward to the results of this election. Yeah, yeah, as you mentioned, it's been a long time. We've been planning for this. I mean, we've spent uh, the last uh, two years essentially looking up forward to this night of the presidential election. So happy to be here. Well, when they use that expression, all politics are local, we have a state senate race that uh, really does uh, directly affect uh, the voters in East Haven, North Haven, Wallingford, and Durham. Looking back on this campaign, how, how do you, not, not how do you think it's going to turn out, but how do you think the campaign went when you have two obviously experienced very qualified people for the same job. Well, I think that's why it went so well. I mean, Lenny has not been challenged for a number of years, and so it was good to have a challenge because that's part of democracy is you know not being complacent and having the accountability at the polls. So it was great to have a candidate such as Steve who was available to run this year, and he put on a great campaign, and it was a spirited campaign, and it was just refreshing to have a campaign for that seat. You know, you said that this campaign affects the local people. Every campaign does, and every level of office does. Uh, your state senator, the four towns that he will represent, um, is, it's very important because there's only 36 of those in the state legislature. So each senator's vote is very important for public policy here in Connecticut. To me, it was very interesting watching this race because they really had tried to work so well together down through the years. Steve had been state representative for 14 years, and of course, Len had been state senator for at least six of those 14 years. So to see them campaign against each other and to watch the debates, it was very interesting. Although they did agree on several issues, the contrast in styles, the contrast in some of the issues, I thought uh, was very striking. So it was interesting to me to see them really campaigning against each other for the first time after the years that they prided each other on working so closely together. So we don't think there's going to be much of a coattail effect if Obama takes Connecticut. You think it's still just going to be local politics playing out? Well, I'll let Walter answer that, then I'll give you my opinion, too. Well, as far as coattails, we're seeing a very interesting election year, uh, especially with the Republican candidate for U.S. Senate, Linda McMahon, not deciding which party she belongs to on a daily basis. So, you know, she is trying to do everything she can to kind of ruin a coattail effect. But to Steve's benefit, there's a stopgap right after that Senate seat. So if people did go to Linda, you still have the best congresswoman in the nation, Rosa DeLore, representing this district. So I would assume that most people would come right back up to the Rosa DeLore line, which may cause some ticket splitting to occur. But, uh, you know, Rosa was right in front of that state Senate seat, and you couldn't have a better congresswoman than her. So she's a good lead-in. Oh, absolutely. During the uh, candidates' forum, which uh, I, I had the privilege of moderating, and I, I was... I don't know, pleasantly surprised, I think I used the word spirited. But at one point, uh, I guess Len made the point that he is not a career politician, and uh, he was making the point that Steve Fontana was, and Steve said, I'm a career public servant. W what's happened in terms of, uh, why can't you be a career politician? We've had some great ones in Connecticut. Well, I think that it's a negative connotation. Um, I don't think people, the average person in the public, uh, I don't think they're satisfied with the, uh, the stereotype of career politicians. And I think that in itself, the phrase, the characterization is something that people are turned off by. And I think part of the other problem in politics today is there seems to be a tremendous uh, 
polarization. There's an acrimonious tone to the debates themselves. We, we've seen it in all different races. And I think that feeds into the stereotype, these career politicians doing what they're doing. I think that the tone has to subside. There has to be a little bit more give and take, some listening on both sides. Because I truly believe, at least at the local level, there's a lot of common ground that can be gained by having those civil discussions. Right. Well, career, career politician is just a campaign phrase. And as you mentioned, they are public servants. I mean, again, looking at the Senate race, that was Linda McMahon's charge against uh, Chris Murphy. And these are public servants. I mean, people who run for office, a lot of them serve on the local boards. You know, people who are on our boards and commissions right now that give you know, a lot of time every month, you know, for the recreation services, so, um, all different boards. They spend a lot of time, and it's not a negative thing. These are things we need to be proud of, and these are the type of people that we need to encourage to run for those higher offices. And then you get the charge, oh, he's a career politician, or she's a career politician. Public servant is the right phrase, uh, because these people are working for the public. And even a congressman, well, what they get paid, and a state senator, state rep, I mean, it's not huge paychecks these people have. They're part-time jobs in our Connecticut legislature, and they are giving up their time for the people of their districts. We have one uh, statistic in so far that as of 7 o'clock this evening, 72 percent, 11,262 North Haven residents had already gone to vote. So we're well on our way to hitting a high probably in the 80s, if not you know, greater than 80 percent. Well, Walter and I were talking about this earlier, and uh, in the last presidential campaign, Walt and I were talking that it was about 82 or 83 percent. So I think you're right, Teal. We're right on track here. I do think I, I just ended the day at Ridge Road, and it's usually busy there at the end of the night, and it was a little slower there at this time. Um, looking at what we were seeing during the day through numbers for our phone calling, when we hit the 72 percent at 7 o'clock, I think a lot of the targeted people that we knew were going to come out came out. Uh, it was getting slow at the polling places. Uh, I'm going to guess it's going to come in really at 74, 75 percent. I don't think we're going to hit the 80. Uh, a couple years ago in 2010, it was a 66.98 percent turnout. Mm -hmm. So I think we're going to do better than it was two years ago. I don't think we're going to hit the highs. I think in two, 2008, the 82.9 percent was the highest North Haven had ever had. Mm -hmm. And of course, there was a national swell of people going to vote that year with uh, Barack Obama's mm -hmm. first uh, election. So here tonight, when he gets reelected, I don't think we're going to hit those same numbers, but we are going to be at least at, you know, hopefully the 75 percent range. It seems like at the local level people can work together. Can we uh, heal this rift that we see in Washington, D.C.? I think it's going to be very difficult, and I think that it's going to take a lot of work to do so. I think that uh, there's got to be a more moderate tone to do that. The shouting on both sides, the incendiary rhetoric, I think, is difficult for the average person really to negotiate and navigate through. At the local level, I would agree with you, Teal. It seems to be much easier to do. Uh, this government, as an example, prides itself on working across party lines, and I think we've had some reasonable success in doing that. Mm -hmm. We don't always agree. Walter and I don't always agree. But at the local level, I think it's a little bit easier to do. It's a lot easier also on a local level. As you saw, in these campaigns that were going on, a lot of outside money. Citizens United that got passed a couple of years ago, that corporations are people. You know, it's clearly not true, but in letting that happen, unlimited funds were coming in from the outside in these campaigns. And how much money was being spent really is what caused the change of tone. Um, at the polls today, most of the complaints that voters have as they're calling up to vote is, geez, you know, I'm just glad this election's over because I'm tired of mm -hmm. seeing those ads. And it, it is both sides that do it. I mean, I, of course, as a Democratic analyst sitting here, would blame the Republicans more because that's my job. But the charges that were thrown out during Linda's campaign against Chris Murphy, uh, you saw a letter that came down from State Elections Enforcement Commission to Linda's campaign a couple days ago saying, you're sending out stuff that's misleading to voters. USA Today ranked her campaign one of the fifth most dishonest in their ads for this campaign. It adds to the rhetoric. And then when the opponent's sitting there, they have to respond. And how do they respond? You know, negative campaigning does work because it gets people to talk about the campaigns. But it's not the type of tone that helps for good government. It's good campaigning. It's not good government when going forward. And if the campaigns get to such a point of rhetoric that the rift that's caused between those candidates means they can't work together afterwards, that's where we're getting at a dangerous point in our politics. So yes, I'd like to see you know, more positive campaigning. 
the mail the only mailings that the North Haven Democratic Town Committee sent out in the state Senate race was solely positive pieces on Steve's behalf um, I, what was sent out from the town committee I think we needed to set that tone of positive messaging here's what our candidate is about here's what he stood for here's everything he's delivered to North Haven over the past couple years and that's the type of campaigning that is not as effective because it doesn't get people to remember and get incendiary and remember the names but it does what is supposed to be done by a town committee to promote positives. We have um, a report coming in now from Joe Villante. He's reporting from Republican headquarters. I have Wayne Winsley here uh, running for Congress. He has an uphill battle, as he knows, against Rosa DeLara, but he's going door to door, and I've seen him on the streets myself doing a wonderful job. Wayne, would you like to say hello to our North Haven audience? Absolutely. Good evening, everyone. Hello, and first of all, thank you, North Haven. Uh, I know a lot of you out there have been supporting this campaign and uh, have been behind us, so thank you very much. And uh, we're, we're going to get this done. I mean, it's it's been a battle. Obviously, this is a fight that no one thought could be won. Well, I'm not giving up. I'm not giving up on the citizens of the 3rd District. And when we win this thing, I will be there for you, and I won't ever give up on you. No, I know you won't. I know you're going door to door, and you're a hard worker, and you say, I'm going to take this challenge, and you did it. David and Goliath, you know, each of the rock and one. And Absolutely. That's yeah. So let, let's tell our wonderful audience here some of the things you're going to do when you win. Absolutely. Uh, my, my goal is simple. Uh, I want to do everything possible to help more of our neighbors go from food stamps to full-time employment. Uh, remove some of the barriers and uncertainty for small, medium, and large businesses so businesses can grow and begin to hire our neighbors. Because guess what? For people to go from food stamps to full-time employment, there has to be a job for them. Also, the other piece of this is making sure more of our children are fully educated and prepared for the modern workforce. That way, when I am advocating for businesses to make Connecticut a destination, we can say that among other things, there is a steady supply of fully qualified employees waiting. You just forgot one thing. We want lower taxes and less waste in Washington. And you're the man that's going to do it. Absolutely. Absolutely. Lower taxes is, is job one. You know, taxes are too high uh, for everyone. Uh, one of the things that I've talked about uh, as a candidate and will work for as a representative is uh, working on the gas tax. I, I've called for a suspension of the gas taxes federally, and I would lean on Governor Malloy to join me and uh, repeal uh, or suspend the gas tax here. 67 cents a gallon right off the bat. Would, Joe, would that make a difference? Oh, it would make a big difference. My God, it'd make yeah, a big that, difference. That's not a tax break for the rich. No, that's for not. Everyone, that's for everybody. Tax so, break. so, and that's that's what I'm interested in. And he can't do anything I'm worried about. He can't balance the budget as it is. In, in Connecticut. So we need somebody like you to push him, I think. Absolutely, and it's uh, great that you mentioned that because uh, right now, our federal budget, we haven't had a budget in three years. That's a shame. That's, That's a shame. Right. You're, you're right. That is a national shame and disgrace. And uh, no, no, uh, not on my watch. Not on my watch. Well, Wayne, I wish you the best of luck. I know you're going to greet the people as they come in. You can see the hall is loaded with people. Absolutely. And they all voted for you. I know that. This is Republican headquarters. <laughs> Good luck. Thank and you very much. the best of luck. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Of course, Joe is sort of doing double duty as a personality as, as well as a field reporter there. Uh, Rosa DeLauro is, I don't think she's ever going to be defeated. Well, I mean, certainly not. Yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't see there's a chance for being defeated. Um, you know, especially with a candidate that confuses state and federal issues just in that one interview. The what I'm hearing right now, actually, I, I got a text a little while ago. New Haven still has lines out voting right now, um, so I don't even think the you had to be in line by eight o'clock to vote. If you were in line, you still got to vote. There are still lines in New Haven, so there's, polls aren't going to be done there for another 45, 50 minutes. But with the results that are come out of New Haven alone, um, Rosa should be, you know, on her, on her way to her 12th term without uh, question. The question for you about strategy, and, and again, you, you have the dual uh, 
capacity to answer this question, ha having been a candidate and, and also being the Democratic town chairman. We have uh, Dave Yaccarino running unopposed, mm -hmm. uh, something that uh, Len Fasano did for many mm -hmm. years. What is the downside when there isn't someone running against an incumbent? Well, certainly, I mean, you want to have candidates for every office. Um, it's very difficult. I mean, as you said, I ran last year, and it's a major time commitment. It's very difficult, and it's difficult to get people to run for offices. Uh, there were some people who were interested in pursuing that office, um, and it is a major time constraint. And, t you know, going into the conversation we had earlier, I mean, people don't really enjoy negative campaigning. It's I can't imagine Chris Murphy's life as he wakes up every morning just wondering what lie Linda McMahon's going to throw at him the next day. Um, you know, in campaigns, sometimes the truth really doesn't matter to some candidates. And I don't think Dave is that way. I don't think Dave would run a campaign like that if we had a candidate against him. But there are people who are just like, you know, why should I put myself out for this? And it's very difficult to find candidates in this environment for that reason. Now, you ask what the downside is in not running candidates. All the, we'll talk New Haven, the whole New Haven delegation was unopposed. And I think that was a concerted effort by the Republican Party to try to not get the Democratic base, the state reps and the state senators in the New Haven area, actively campaigning this year to try to suppress some of the vote in New Haven. It's not going to work. We're going to have a higher turnout in New Haven than we had in previous years. But that it, there are some strategies that do exist in that way that, you know, I, I think there was a concerted effort to not run candidates in a number of seats to try to suppress vote. I think, Ken, that the downside to running on a pose is the interpretation that the public may have that it may be a deterioration of the two-party system. And I think the public really likes the two-party system. The public wants to hear not the incendiary rhetoric, as we've been talking about here, but they want to hear what each candidate is going to do for them. So the downside is I think the public looks at it and says, you know, we don't have another voice to hear and another platform to analyze. Now, for those that run unopposed, I think it's key that you cannot get complacent. And Dave Yaccarino is a great example of that. He was out knocking on doors and campaigning as if he had an opponent. So I think the key is, if you do run opposed, to do everything that you normally would do if you had someone running against you. Well, exactly. And Marty Looney, who is the, uh, the Democratic representative for portion of New ha North Haven now, you know, he was unopposed, but yet he was out at the polls today with me at the end of the day, and he was campaigning all along. So you can't get complacent. And you know, one of the reasons I ran last year is I couldn't let Mike get complacent. I needed to have a campaign against him and keep him. And you know, some of the issues I did bring up, he addressed them. And uh, you know, maybe that works better for the town of North Haven long term because he wasn't just able to sit there and not have a challenge. I hope those people watching know that complacency is a word that's not in my vocabulary. <laughs> so that I can guarantee you. But I think that Walter makes a good point, though. When you have candidates running against candidates, uh, candidates running against incumbents, I think it's very, very important that the public have a dual view to look at the incumbent and look at the opponent to make their own decisions. Once again, we're going to uh, return to Republican headquarters, and Joe Vianti is going to uh, bring us another interview with, uh, of course, that particular style that Joe has. Joe Vianti here at Republican headquarters. I have. Uh, Carolyn Wright, the chairman of the Republican Party of North Haven. Carolyn, I know there's a lot of work to do in the party. Give us an idea of what you do during the day. Well, we have started this whole procedure a long, long time ago. Um, we open up headquarters in September, but long before that we lay out everything that has to be done. And when we open up headquarters, uh, the first thing we do is we get our lawn sign list together. There's a lot of phone calling to make sure people want. We never put a sign on anybody's lawn if they don't want it. We call them first, so we do all that. We get our absentee uh, voters. We have a list of people that ask for absentees every year, and we spend a lot of time uh, doing that. We, we spend a lot of time. We're in headquarters every single day, and uh, we field phone calls, and we help the candidates, uh, Len and Dave and uh, Linda and Romney, and we're helping everybody. Uh, whatever is needed of us, we're there for them. So how does it look in your eyes? What's going to happen tonight? Tonight? Locally in North Haven. Well, definitely Len is going to win big. And uh, he's a wonderful candidate. And uh, I think the town knows that. And uh, of course, Dave is running unopposed, so uh, we're not concerned. And Well, I'm concerned. He's going to win, isn't he? He's going to win. Yeah. But you know, he doesn't 
He doesn't uh, act like he's unopposed. He has still walked. He's walked hundreds and hundreds of homes, and he's talked to everybody because that's the type of uh, person he is. Yeah. Uh, and uh, everybody else is working their tail off. We're all working very hard. I think it's going to be a good night. I think Romney's going to take it, and uh, I think we're going to be very happy. We're going to have a big celebration. Let's let's take a look at that uh, comment there. The, the the Republicans forecasting that uh, Len will win uh, is uh, with the redistricting kind of things that have been going on. Is there a different scenario for this time around? Is a uh, or did things not change all that much? No, absolutely. I mean, there, there is a plan to victory. Um, the the district as it was redistricted, you know, made it a little more difficult for Steve. But the um, plan that we put in place, and we were making calls for months, you know, targeting our voters, you know, for the whole slate of candidates, um, knowing who was going to come out and vote for Democratic, and we got on the phone today and made calls to try and make sure those people came out. Um, it's not just a shoe-in victory for any candidate. Uh, it still takes a lot of work, and I'm hopeful that we got our voters out today. How do you uh, interface with uh, East Haven, Durham, Wallingford? Well, I interface very well. I've had regular meetings with the town chairs in those towns. Um, we are regularly involved in uh, you know, each other's fundraisers, each other's events, um, campaign meetings as far as getting getting out the vote operations, getting them put together. You know, following up on that, even you know, I'm Carolyn's counterpart as the Democratic town chair here in North Haven, and all the things she just mentioned are what people don't see that goes into what the political parties do, and why political parties are important. You know. It is a lot of planning to get to this stage. You know, elections don't just happen, you know, overnight and magically everything's in place. You know, there is the issues of making sure the lawn signs are ordered, the you know, mailing campaign gets done right, who the volunteers are, where they're going to get scheduled. It's a lot of work, um, and we've got some great town chairs in Wallingford and East Haven as well, Democratic Republican side. You know, I know Carolyn's worked very hard in this election, and the other people that are sometimes forgot are our election officials. You know, things went smoothly here in North Haven today. You know, as I was following the news during the day, major problems in East Hartford, uh, hours, hours waits in East Hartford because they had voting lists mm -hmm. printed incorrectly. Things like that haven't happened in North Haven. They happen smoothly here, and it's because we have two great registrars of voters who are putting this together, uh, Lori Brangie on the Republican side and Patty Jackson Marshall on the Democratic side. And a lot of people, you know, they just go to the polls and, you know, cast their vote and leave and don't really think about all that went to that moment, uh, the planning. And the fact that we haven't had problems here in North Haven with our ballots because we have a good team of people working there. I think this is an interesting scenario between between State Senator Len Fasano and Steve Fontana. If we look back two years ago, Dave Yaccarino beat Steve, and I think it was 55 to 45. Roughly, those were the numbers. So let's assume that even Steve, if, if Steve can make up some ground in North Haven. Len has always had a foothold and a strength in East Haven and North Haven. So the way I see this unfolding, Wallingford turns out to be the key. Wallingford, the largest community, larger than North Haven and East Haven. It'll be interesting to see if Steve made inroads in Wallingford. In my personal opinion, I think Steve needs to win Wallingford, Wallingford big to have a chance to beat Len Fasano overall. On a national level, um, there were stories about uh, employers sort of trying to coax or at least broaching the subject about an Obama win might mean they might lose their jobs. Did we have any instance of that happening in Connecticut at all? Well, I can tell you it didn't happen in North Haven. I, I haven't heard that, Walter, in Connecticut. I haven't heard any reports uh, similar to that. Because I know Steve Wynn was one of the people out in Nevada that, uh, and I, that I guess came about after Citizens United. So those kinds of things, how are they going to impact the public's perception of, of, um, of politics. Well, I think that's why Citizens United is, you know, a damaging decision uh, and how it affects politics, uh, because it does let corporations affect the political process in a more direct way than the individual. Um, you know, the situation you're talking about, you know, you may see on some of the Fox News and the MSNBCs. You know, I haven't had any personal experiences of those or stories of those here in Connecticut. But it doesn't mean that their money can't influence votes and how much money, you know, is put into these campaigns and a lot of these negative ads. I think it certainly feeds into the negativity in the public's mind. I think the public is, quite frankly, disgusted mm -hmm. with the negativity, and I think it's turned a lot of people off. 
So I'm happy to see the turnout here in North Haven, as we just saw, and I'm interested to see what the turnout is across the country in light of the fact that most people are saying they can't wait for this or these elections to end because they're sick and tired of the negative campaigning. Well, this just in, we have some results from uh, three of our uh, districts. And in the Park and Rec District, Len Fasano, 1,201 votes. Steve Fontana, 971. So it's a 55-45% split there. Montuis. Um, 1,062 for Fasano and 1,005 for Fontana. Difference of 57 votes, and it's 51 to 49 Fasano over Fontana. And in Green Acres, 773 for Len Fasano, 534 for Steve Fontana. It's a 59 to 41 split. And uh, the totals? 3,036 Len Fasano, 2,510 Steve Fontana. 55% to 45%. And that uh, represents at this point a uh, 35% turnout for the state senate in numbers North in North Haven. So uh, what do you read? Well, just looking at it really quick, I mean, Steve's strong district should be Clintonville. Um, and Ridge Road is probably going to take a while to get results in because there's two different ballots. So, you know, part of the district is uh, Marty Looney's. But it does feed into what Mike was saying earlier, in that Wallingford is going to be key to these mm -hmm. numbers. I think East Haven, you're going to also see close numbers like this. Um, Steve spent the summer door to door in Wallingford, Durham, and East Haven working very hard on this campaign. So and hopefully his message got out. Uh, these numbers are, are interesting to me. Uh, Steve is also a, a volunteer fireman in the Montawis district, and that number, as Ken mentioned, is 51 to 49. Of course, the two largest districts are Clintonville and Ridge Road. Uh, Walter, Walter's point regarding Steve in Clintonville, that'll be very interesting to see that the way that plays out. Len's home district is Green Acres, and he won that, according to these numbers, by 59-49. So, but interesting where we are right now, 55-45. Some more results at, coming in. At Clintonville, uh, 1,697 for Len Fasano, 1,236 Steve Fontana. And that gives us 58% to 42%. And we're up to now 54% the turnout for senator. And the totals, uh, Len Fasano, 4,733. Steve Fontana, 3,746, a 56-44 divide. And you were just predicting uh, Clintonville stronghold. Well, well certainly, I, I, was hoping, uh, I was hoping Clintonville was going to be a, a little closer. And perhaps a Steve victory. I mean, he did spend a good portion of his day there. That's where he was campaigning uh, most of today um, as far as in North Haven. But again, remember, right now we're only looking at a real small microcosm of the vote. I mean, mm -hmm. we've got three other towns we need to get results from. And to that point, if we look at these numbers, it looks like in North Haven, Len is going to win handily. It would have to be a, a, a really a huge victory for Steve in Ridge Road to overturn these numbers. Right now, again, 56-46. But back to Walter's point, I think what's happening here is that really Wallingford and East Haven numbers really, really need to see. Mm -hmm. And the problem we have with Ridge Road is, again, Steve doesn't have the full district. It's only part of the district. So in North Haven alone right now, with the four numbers in, we don't have absentees in either. You know, Len has a thousand volt margin approximately, just doing the math in my head. Mm -hmm. And um, I don't think there's a way to have that differential made up in Ridge Road just because it's not the full district. I know this is going to sound like a civics lesson, but sometimes uh, that's what we need. How did the district come to be the way it is with Senator Looney taking part of North Haven here? At, uh, I grew up in Philadelphia. We had this thing called gerrymandering, and redistricting down there was an art as much as a science. But what was the dynamic here that created this new 34th district? Well, it's the same everywhere. I mean, there's a census every 10 years, and what you try to do, what the legislature is charged with doing, is every 10 years redefining the districts so that the 36 Senate districts are roughly even in population. So, um, you know, as they're carving up, you know, the New Haven areas, the Hamden areas, and trying to make the pieces of the jigsaw puzzle fit, you know, uh, they needed to make Marty Looney's district a little larger, and the closest place they could get that from was North Haven and there was room that they could add Durham into the district so the districts were still even and Marty Looney didn't end up with a district that went from New Haven to Hamden and then up some other strange direction so you know the closest place they could add to his district was North Haven which 
ends up being an amazing benefit to North Haven. Because Marty Looney is the majority leader, 22 years experience in the state senate, and is just going to be an excellent state senator for the town of North Haven. And we are now one of those towns that has two state senators. You know, there's um, 36 state senators in the, in the state, and most of them represent a number of towns, but not many towns have two wow. state senators within their borders, let alone, you know, right now, the majority leader, Marty Looney, one of the best state senators in the state. And, you know, Lenny, if he does go on to re-election, is the minority leader, so we're going to have two of the most powerful Democrat and Republican state senators representing us in North Haven. You know, as the results come in and, you know, we it, it, adding Steve to Marty Looney would make us even stronger having two strong Democrats. But having a the minority leader and the majority leader are great for North Haven's future. I think it is good for North Haven. And the other thing that really has gone unnoticed down through the years is that both Len and Marty have very good crossover appeal. Len and Marty work very well together. And if um, Len does win this seat and beat Steve, I really anticipate a great working relationship to continue on behalf of the town of North Haven. Now, Marty Looney and I have known each other for years, well long, well, long before and well before I decided to enter the political world. And we went to the same high school together, so I envision a good crossover, bipartisan working relationship should Len Fasano beat Steve and Marty beat our state senator. And to have Marty as the majority leader and Len as the minority, that is definitely good for North Haven. During the candidates' forum, uh, uh, I think uh, Len Fasano made a point about how the Democrats in Hartford did not listen to the Republicans. I mean, they, they were not, they weren't providing input, and they weren't even invited to do that. And now it, it almost seems ironic that uh, there's a synergy here between two of the most powerful political figures in the state, and North Haven's their common denominator. Well. That that's true, and I, you know, when uh, when Lenny had made those comments during the debate, I was kind of looking at you know when he was saying those comments, you know, making some notes on them. But it does end up being a good working relationship, and Marty's already been taking proactive steps to get involved with uh, the North Haven administration, and you know, looking out with the uh, bonding issues and issues for the town. So how did North, North Haven really, from your perspectives, is really sitting in, a, in a, an enviable position if if Len Fasano does return? And uh, if it's uh, Steve Fontana, who has four, you know, 14 years' experience in the legislature, you're, you're still well represented. A uh, little difference in how the seniority would work out. Right. Because you know, as Lenny mentioned in those debates, I mean, the Democrats do have the power in Hartford, so having two Democratic senators would be excellent for the town. But um, having the highest ranking Republican would also be a benefit to the town if uh, Steve is unsuccessful tonight. Well, Joe Vianti is uh, oh. really Can we, we going to wait for a moment. Wait for one second. I'm sorry. <laughs> That's we okay. Were, Don't be sorry. Um, I'm sorry. You've got some new yeah. information. Okay. Uh, I do. The new information is that WFSB Channel 3 is projecting that Murphy has beaten McMahon. So that, that we just got that in, just this second. And now we can go to Joe Leonte at Republican headquarters. I have Joe Derrico here. He's the election day coordinator for the Republican Party here. And it's very difficult to get him. He, I had to drag him over because he's so busy. Joe, tell us what you do. What does a coordinator do? Well, we start at 6 o'clock in the morning. Uh, we get our people uh, lined up to uh, stand at the polling places in the five districts in town to greet people as they come in. Uh, hopefully, to we got some palm cards if we have some of that stuff. We hand them out to them, and uh, during the course of the day, every hour, I'm in contact with the registrar of voters to see how the voting uh, goes out, uh, the people, how many people we're getting out to the polls and vote. How are we doing today? Do we have a lot of a lot of numbers? Yeah. Well, as of <coughs> excuse me, as of seven o'clock, I uh, just got the seven o'clock numbers in. We got 72 percent of the town, uh, we got some 15,000 registered voters in town and 11,262 uh, individuals have voted as of 7 o'clock. Wow, we got a good turnout this we year. We do, yes. Well, we may fall a little bit short than four years ago because four years ago we had 80% in, and in the next hour I don't think we'll make that number. Uh, we could. But 4 thousand people can't right. come out there's a lot of excitement this year we have wonderful Absolutely. candidates running this year and there's we a lot do. of excitement we had a lot of a lot of enthusiasm a lot of people are uh, really uh, looking for change 
Looking for change. That's a nice word, looking for yeah, change. Right, <laughs> yes. Yeah. Uh, of course, being a Republican here in town, we hope, and I'm pretty sure that uh, Lenny Pisano will win uh, his seat back here for the next two years. I see you do a lot of work there. I was watching you on the board, getting it all set up. Right. What does that mean, all those well, numbers? Well, I have to board? get people. What I do is, uh, uh, I, because of the five districts, what we like to do, we like to get early numbers, and we have a form that we fill out, <clears throat> excuse me, that we fill out that I send two people up to each polling place. And usually what I try to do is to let these people know they got to get inside the door before 8 o'clock, because once the, uh, 8 o'clock the doors are locked and no one else can get in. Now, when they go there, they can't wear, obviously, anything on them that indicates the, who they are, who they are yeah, or who yeah. they be representing. And uh, they take the numbers down as, they, uh, as the... Um, Machines. The, yeah, the, the person who is the coordinator at the uh, right. polling place reads out the numbers, and they read them out loud, and they, every, uh, if you're there, you get to write the numbers down. Now, usually, because in this case here, our main candidate for the town would be Lenny Fasano, and I would ask them to call me in once we get the numbers for Lenny, so we know exactly what we, uh, where we are, and how we stand. We'll also have here representatives from the town of East Haven and Wallingford, and we'll get a call from somebody in Durham, uh, and uh, we'll be able to know. So your main job is the coordinator. That's a nice title you got. Yeah, I coordinate uh, to, it all. <laughs> co yeah. Coordinate it all, and then you put it on the big board we over there. We put it on the big board over right, there, and right. it also uh, we keep the numbers all on with the computer system, so we know where we are from election to election. We're uh, awaiting uh, several reports that are coming in from Democratic headquarters, just in case. Uh, you were wondering when the other side would be uh, airing, and that's coming. I, I do want to comment that the report about uh, uh, Chris Murphy being projected as the winner over Linda McMahon actually comes from the Associated Press. And uh, my, I don't know what the word is, uh, my belief in projections uh, really isn't as strong as it once was. And uh, on the national level tonight, something is going to happen that's unprecedented. Since 11 o'clock this morning, the major networks and cable networks have been huddled in a room, and they're getting all kinds of data, and they are apparently going to jointly announce their projection for the winner of the presidential race so that we don't have a situation in which somebody's predicting this and somebody's predicting that. So we don't have a 2000. But, yeah, but having said that, I think one of the disservices is when they do these projections before the polls have closed across the time zones. Mm -hmm. And uh, as we also saw, John Kerry, based on exit polls, 4 o'clock that afternoon, was people were saying he's won based mm -hmm. on exit polls, and that proved to be incorrect. Uh, I'm not saying it just takes the excitement out of it and all of that. I just think in terms of the value of the vote, sometimes these early projections really uh, diminish the quality of uh, the electorate in terms of they, well, I guess it's all over, when in fact it's not. When did we start doing polls every day? I don't know about every day, but uh, they're it, <laughs> it seems like they're almost hourly. Out. Um, but what are your thoughts? Uh, on, uh, you must do some kind of internal polling locally, and, and, but we don't read about those or hear about them much. Well, well, locally, I mean, the polls here in Connecticut all change, all close at the same time, eight o'clock. Eight o'clock. So you're not going to have a time issue um, where you're, you know people aren't going to go out to vote because they think the election's over. And I think tonight was a good example because you knew this race was going to be close between Murphy and McMahon. And even though the polls were breaking Murphy's way, um, you know, the polls over the weekend were saying a nine percent lead. It's still not really finished. I mean, I think a lot of the projections that are being made by the AP are based on what we're seeing in New Haven, that that is a strong Murphy vote. Greenwich's vote total is down so far this year, which is, you know, one of her bases. You know, the turnout has been lighter there going through the day. So, I, you know, I think whatever projections they're using based on, you know, their exit polling, 
I don't think the polls are really close to call that one yet. And Linda McMahon has already laid the groundwork last week that she was going to challenge New Haven's results, issues like that. So, I mean, she does have the ability to drag this on because, as she's proven, she can afford to just keep spending money to do whatever she wants to and do. I'm, I'm sure we have people uh, yeah. in Greenwich and places like that who are still trying to recover from Sandy. I, I, I haven't true. heard... But exactly the, how the turnouts were. But also the same is true of Bridgeport, mm -hmm. you know, and that's one of, that's going to be a strong Democratic stronghold. So it does offset each other there. I always am reminded of the old history with uh, President Truman and Dewey and the headlines in that paper, Dewey Beats Truman. I think that people should look at the early prognostications and say, okay, that seems to be an indication of the way it's going, but in many respects it may not be indicative of what the final results are. And one thing I think is important for those people who are hearing what the projected winners are, and let's say they're before the 8 o'clock deadline on vote, on voting, and then they decide not to vote because they think there's already a winner, that really should never happen. Mm -hmm. Every vote's so important. Yeah, no, every vote is so important. There's never a reason not to vote. I mean, look at our turnout. Our turnout's going to be, you know, 75% here in town. That still means that one in four people didn't vote in town. Right. And an election this important, this close, and every election is important. You don't know, say, well, this is the most important election of our lifetime. No, every election is important. And still, one in four people didn't vote. So as happy as I am about 75%, you know, what message needs to go out to the other one in four to get their involvement? Because it is so important. Every vote counts. And even if the plurality ends up being really large, really small, every vote is important. And we're uh, going to hear now from uh, Marcus Haroun, reporting from the Democratic headquarters. We're here now with Ms. Reynolds at the Democratic headquarters. I'd first like to ask you, this year being a big election year with the national election, did that affect at all how you were campaigning, how the committee worked for the candidates this year in the town of North Haven and Wallingford in this area? No, I don't think so. I think we try every time there's an election to help the candidates, whether they're local or on a national level. If anything, it's just we had to kind of spread ourselves out you know, across the board. For example, today I took part of my day campaigning for um, making calls for Obama, okay. and the rest of the time I came here and supported the local candidates. And uh, did you work at all for the, uh, the Murphy campaign? Yes, I have. I made calls for a minute. We've had Thursday night calls at um, Vinnie Allen's office, at the, his office here in Wallingford, mm -hmm. uh, for the last few months. And I've been there and helped make calls on Thursday evenings. So how has it been so far today? How was the turnout at the polls? Actually, I think it was really good. I mean, I was there at noon. I work from home, so I'm fortunate to be able to go whenever I want. And I went at noon, and there was a good crowd there, surprisingly. You know, what at lunchtime, you're going to see a lot of people. But I mean, I, from what I understand, it's been constant all day. So, and the weather helped. You know, it was good weather. So. And um, what would you say was the biggest challenge this year campaigning for the for the Democrats? You know what? I honestly think the ads, the negativity. It seems like it. There, it was. It was a tough year in terms of campaigns. If you look at the ads on TV or even listen what people say, and and try to call when you call um, people. You know, to ask who they want to vote for, they talk about it too. So I think that's probably the part that bothered me the most. This year. I think it was tough. Did you find that had any effect at the local level too for state senate? Oh, that's. I think it was worse. You know, like the Linda McMahon. Um, I really felt that I've never seen anything like it. It was constant, and it, it got to the point where p people were saying to me. I can't wait for this to be over, so I don't have to listen to this anymore. How about for Steve Fontana? Nobody ever insulted anything, because Steve's not like that. He's such a he's such a nice man. I just don't even, I don't understand how they would even find a way to say something like that about him. He's not, I, I don't know. Not that Chris Murphy is, he's not either, but it's just, I think it was who Chris Murphy's opponent was. So I think it was a different, it was a different battle from a race. Well, thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Yeah, definitely. A, a, hold on here. That's uh, some feedback. My fault. Uh, definitely a difference in the state senate race and the uh, U.S. senate race. 
but uh, as as the evening progresses, what what are do you have any idea when you think we will have a declared winner in the state senate race? What's anticipated? Uh, well, I, I imagine if I was at the headquarters, I'd probably be on the phone getting some numbers now. It, they're probably just coming back, and they're going to be being relayed to the reporters. Um, just being right here right now, I, I don't have my, you know, boots on the ground any longer. How do the numbers the come in for a state senate race? Well, what you do is you have someone at each polling place at the end of the night to wait there at 8 o'clock, and as the registrars, as the printouts come out of the machine, um, they quickly call into whatever number you give them. You know, so they'll call into... Uh, it, we have a central person at the headquarters that is just looking for the phone calls from like in North Haven, each of five districts. I have one person sitting there at 8 o'clock. As soon as those numbers come in, they make a call to Steve's campaign manager, they make a call to Chris Murphy's campaign manager, and Rosa Dolores' campaign manager, so they instantly have the numbers. So the Secretary of State's not really in the loop? The Secretary of State does not get the official results from the registrars until the end of the night. So around 10 o'clock uh, of the night, the registrar or whoever the head moderator is for the election, which I believe is John Preecy tonight here in North Haven, he'll send the official certification to the Secretary of State, and the Secretary of State will then certify it, you know, tomorrow. So the numbers, we, when you're getting them from the AP, uh, even when you get them from the AP, um, they're basing it on their people in different polling places mm -hmm. um, to give you that data. Um, so the Secretary of State's always the last one to do it because they need to have the official proper certification. And uh, uh, there are uh, projections right now from uh, Channel 3 in Hartford that Rosa DeLauro has been reelected. And that's no big surprise to yes. most of us. Yes, and you've got some Durham information. That's uh, uh, all of, I assume this is all of North Haven right now because what we have is 4,992 for Fasano, Fontana 3,677, and Durham comes in. Fasano 571, Fontana 455. So across the board, obviously, Fasano has been um, leading. What do we expect will come from East Haven and uh, Wallingford? Well, I'm not sure. The numbers you just gave, I think, are a little lower than the ones we gave earlier, so it might not be the complete number in North Haven. Um, I'm expecting number, okay. yeah, <laughs> hopefully, hopefully we'll have from East Haven soon and Wallingford soon. Um, well, you're right, yes. Uh, yeah, it's just, so I, I don't think this yet has the Ridge Road District, again, because okay. you know, the, the moderators okay. have to run two machines and different information in Ridge Road, so that's just not gotten to us yet. What, do you think that Wallingford could make a difference? How big a, wa a, a, a path is there in Wallingford? Well, Wallingford is probably the, the major difference. I mean, that's, that's where both candidates have been spending most of their time in the past couple weeks, um, and that's where the, you know, the most votes are out to get. I mean, mm -hmm. in, in Wallingford, there's multiple state rep races that are also going on, so it's going to take a little longer to get the numbers out of Wallingford, um, but there were some very active campaigns going on in Wallingford. Um, so that might take a little while to get those numbers. Uh, looking at the U.S. Senate race, do we think there'll be a concession tonight if the stats hold up, or is this going to be contested? What's in it for Linda to concede? <laughs> I mean, you know, the, she's, uh, she's been in it for herself the whole time. And I think that uh, considering what she's been doing the past couple of weeks as far as the lawsuit against New Haven last week, I don't know if the viewers at home know, she filed a lawsuit against New Haven last week alleging that they didn't order enough ballots. She withdrew the lawsuit. But part of what she's been doing, even with the tactics today, you know, with uh, people wearing shirts that looked like union shirts, so people thought they were out there for the union, telling them that they needed to vote for Obama and her. Oh, you know, a lot of the things she's been doing is just leading up to, look, she's put $100 million into this race. So I guess from her, for a couple more million dollars to keep challenging it, unless the numbers come in, you know, really, really well, which I, I believe they will. I mean, yeah, we uh, she'll keep up. jump to the first results into us, and they look... Uh, Substantial here, East Haven, Len Fasano, 5,910, Steve Fontana, 4,548. Well, that's quite significant. I mean, that's a, that's a swing there of almost 1,400 votes. Durham, Len looks like he beat Steve there by 116 votes. It would seem to me that Steve would have to win in Wallingford by over 60 percent to have a chance to to beat Len in this election. Yeah, looking at the numbers so far, I mean, the numbers that would have to come out of Wallingford would almost have to be numbers that never came out of Wallingford mm -hmm. for a Democratic uh, state senate candidate. Um, so you know, while we don't have those numbers yet, it's going to be a very difficult 
number to overcome at this time. And we still have in North Haven, you know, the Ridge Road District, which hasn't come in. The numbers we just saw earlier are a little bit distorted in my view because it shows land with 2,000 more votes than we had in the previous report, but it shows Steve with less votes, with about 1,000 less votes. So we really need to get a little bit more accurate information in terms of North Haven. But East Haven, I think you'd have to consider that a landslide victory there. One of the things it says, we don't have the absentee votes, but I'm assuming that wouldn't be a, uh, make much of a difference at this point. No, it, it actually will. I mean, there, there is a lot of people that voted absentee in this election. Um, so I, I do think the absentee numbers probably skewed a little more Republican this year because, uh, again, Linda McMahon was spending a lot of money encouraging absentee balloting, and you would imagine that Linda's voters would also be voting for Lenny for the most part. But we did have a very active absentee ballot campaign going on on the Democratic side uh, through East Haven, through North Haven, and through Wallingford for Steve. So, you know, I, I don't have an idea at this point of how the absentees look. If uh, Steve Fontana does not unseat Lynn Fasano, what's ahead for him? I, I still think this is a seat that Steve can win. So I, I would encourage Steve probably to, you know, not go away to he, he laid a lot of groundwork in this campaign with his door-to-door. -door. So I, I do think we'll be seeing more from Steve if he's not successful tonight. I would say Steve has three options in the future. He certainly could do what Walter has suggested. Steve could run against me in next year's local election here, or Steve could make a run against Dave Yaccarino in two years. I think, he'll, I think Steve really um, will continue to pursue an option in politics. Uh, unless I'm mistaken, I don't see Steve just saying, I'm through with this mm -hmm. career. Well, and again, that ties to something we spoke about a half hour ago. I mean, there's public servants and there's lifelong politicians. Steve is a public servant. I mean, if you look at the campaign between him and Lenny, the reason a lot of them, both of them had a lot of positive things to say is because they both did deliver a lot for the town of North Haven during their time of representation here. So I hope Steve's not done um, because he has a lot left to give to the people of this town. There always will come a time, though. It's like being an athlete where your time does come. And none of us really know when that time is going to come. And sometimes it comes through the years in, and sometimes it comes through your own internal feelings that you just don't want to do this anymore for the reasons that Walter had suggested earlier, negative campaigning, finding candidates. Sometimes it does take a toll. But it'll be very, very interesting. And it'll be very interesting to see where Len goes in the future. Will he continue to run for state senator? So there's a lot of options, I think, available and a, a lot of slots open in the future for both state rep, for state senator, and for the mayors and first selectmen all across the state mm -hmm. of Connecticut. What do you expect from the legislature next time around with the Democrats uh, assuming that they maintain the huge majority that they have? Walter? Well, look, I think Dan Malloy has done a remarkable job in the past two years. Um, he has taken control of the state budget, and he's been working towards correcting a number of years of uh, deficits. And I think the Democratic legislature is going to be his partner in that. I mean, he's going to be up for election two years, as all these state reps and state senators are going to be as well. But, uh, you know, there is, uh, I think the projection was a $40 million deficit that Kevin Limbo uh, released uh, last week for the state of Connecticut. So there's a lot of work to be done there. And what people are missing is situations like Hurricane Sandy and how much that takes a toll financially on a state, and that's not planned for. And one of the things we saw with Hurricane Sandy, we saw it in New Jersey with uh, Governor Christie and Barack Obama. It does bring together politicians, no matter what party you're on. Um, the governor was working with the uh, first Selectman Frieda on uh, efforts. You know, there are times like that which they're not accounted for in a budget, but cause a lot of that deficit. But they are needs that the government responds to. And I don't think you've seen partisanship in the recent tragedy. And I don't think you're going to see an ongoing partisanship in the next two years. I think they're going to get together. I think they're going to put together a good budget for the state of Connecticut that will benefit us in the next uh, two years. Yeah, it, it's interesting how sometimes a crisis situation will bring people together. Just the other day, I was on a conference call with the three governors, with Governor Malloy, uh, Governor Cuomo, 
Governor um, Christie and some of the mayors in each one of the states of, of, that we're talking about, New Jersey, New York, and uh, Connecticut. So I had the opportunity to, to sit on the conference call and actually President Obama was piped in addressing all of us on the call. And what I saw in that call was, despite the fact that there has been some playful poking against each other between Governor Christie and Governor Malloy here in Connecticut, they really came together on that call and they really are looking to work closely together to help what is really a crisis in terms of the devastation in New Jersey. And as we sat on the conference call listening myself and there were six other mayors and first selectmen out of the 169 in Connecticut, we realized that what's happening in New York and New Jersey is, is just unbelievable in terms of the people who are desperate for help. So it was nice to see that partisanship become working in a bipartisan fashion. That was refreshing. Uh, the other thing is, how did the uh, utilities respond this time? I know there were long outages, but did, did, was something learned from Irene last year? Well, that's something we spent a lot of time on in my office this week, and I can answer that, Teal, by saying that we had additional resources from the UI. Um, we still see, many of us uh, as chief elected officials, see an area of improvement for, for the utility companies, and that is I think that there needs to be a vertically integrated model where the teams are working together. And those teams are the Make Safe Crew teams. Those teams should include tree trimming crews and power restoration crews. What I saw this week was a lag time, a little bit of a delay in an effort to make everything safe and trim trees. There was a delay in getting the power restoration crews in town. And we were relentless in terms of working with the UI to get us up and running. The 95% goal by Monday midnight was unacceptable to me. We set a goal of 95% by Friday, and we're at 97% by Friday night in power restoration in North Haven. One of the positives that I've seen in recent weeks because of the presidential election is uh, college students finally getting excited. Uh, I teach in two universities, and uh, I was pleased compared to where we were at the beginning of the semester where they just didn't seem to quite understand what was at stake for them. But in the past few weeks with registration and I showed them how they can get uh, registration applications online and uh, they downloaded it and I paid the postage, no big deal, took it to the post office and uh, I'd say about 90% of my students voted and most of them were voting for the first time and they really were excited. But the part that um, I, I had to sell a little bit is don't just vote for president. And they were saying, well, we don't, we don't know the other people. Now, they, they sort of knew the Senate candidates. But how do you get the, the next generation, the ones that are going to be voting for the next 50 years, how do you get them to get more involved in the local politics and recognize, for example, state rep and state senate are very important players in their lives? It, that is one of the hardest challenges for a local party, for the state parties. Um, you get these turnouts in presidential years. We just said four years ago it was 83 percent, two years ago it was only 66 percent, yet how much more impact does a governor and the state officials have on everyone's lives than, in all honesty, the president? I mean, it, this is local tax policies, you know, a lot of local policies that are determined by the governor. And people don't get involved in those elections, don't feel it's as important as a presidential. Um, it is one of the challenges is to try to create that interest. A lot of it is social networking these days. People are, you know, talking politics on Facebook and on Twitter, but it's still not getting kids, young adults, to the polls. I could tell there was excitement at Quinnipiac because a lot of my Obama lawn signs kept disappearing along Harford Turnpike in that area, and I knew they were taking them back to the dorms, and I had planned for that. I overordered Obamas for that area, figuring a lot of the Quinnipiac students would want those lawn signs, so I did keep replacing them in those areas. Um, and I was fine with that. I had planned for that because you want the involvement of the youth. Um, well, we have uh, basically, I, I, we used to call these bulletins. And uh, this bulletin says that as of 8.55 p.m., Steve Fontana called uh, Len Fasano and, Fasano and has conceded the election to him. We don't have the numbers, but obviously Steve knows more than we do about the results. Well, exactly. He had someone in each polling place that, I mean, I'm sure probably by 8.20 he had gotten phone calls from each polling place, but, you know, those numbers didn't trickle back because nothing's officially going to come out till every race is counted. Um, but if Steve did, you know, concede the race, 
again, this puts us where we were earlier, where as a town, as North Haven, we have two of the most powerful state senators representing mm -hmm. us. So this is, you know, for the town, this is an excellent position to be in. And I, I would agree, and I'll, I would like to take it a step further by saying that, you know, it, when we look at working across party lines in a bipartisan fashion, there also is some great value, too, to having three individuals in the town regarding um, this setup with myself, with Dave Yaccarino, and with Len Fasano. Dave and Len have been friends of mine long before we ever entered these careers, so there's something to be said for that. The addition of Marty Looney in North Haven, who also represents a great deal of crossover appeal, I think is going to be a great team. I would agree with Walter on that. The team of Marty Looney, Len Fasano, Dave Yaccarino, with me working with them as a local official, I think is very important. And I'll tell you, Ken, coming back to one of your points earlier about what we do in, in Hartford, I really think that, and I'm going to really work on this for whatever influence I may have, work with both Marty and Len to see if they, as the majority and minority leader at our state senate level, can really help set a new tone, a tone that works across the party lines to get things done. And that's what we'll focus in on. Well, and I think already, I mean, Marty Looney and Len Fasano have been doing that for their whole careers. Um, so I do think that, uh, you know, the bipartisan effort that's going to work for the betterment of North Haven, the groundwork is there. So it appears, from all indications, that the election for state senator is over. And uh, does that mean that the first electman race has just begun? Well, as I mentioned earlier, I think Steve certainly has three options. If Steve continues to choose to stay as a public servant, then I think his three options would include certainly running against me in the next election, uh, which would be a year from now, or running against Dave Yaccarino, um, who will be up in two years, or running again for state senator, depending upon what Len Fasano's um, intentions are after that. So there's certainly three options for Steve. The question is, what does he do in the next year? Because that's the first thing I think he needs to decide. And what do you think uh, at this point are likely to be the major issues as we go back to hyper-local election? Well, the issues at a local level are always taxes. You know, we had no tax increase this year. The mill rate's at 26.54. We didn't really lose any services. And it's always a challenge for a chief elected official to maintain a very moderate mill rate and tax rate. I would say that the issues here are always uh, continued economic development. You know, we have a situation, Ken, Walter, and Teal, and Walter knows this, we have a middle school that's aging and it's decrepit and we're going to have to make a decision and sometime next year we're going to have to go to the public and I'll, I'll be doing that with the superintendent to present to the public what the options are for the middle school in the future. I mean, if you're looking at what next year's campaign issues are yet, I mean, I, I don't know those yet, but the middle school is going to be one of them. We're going to see what kind of budget Mike Fried is going to present to the town um, to see if he maintains services and at what rate that's going to cost us on our budget and what decisions he has made. Um, you know, Steve, to go back to what was just said, Steve did serve as second selectman. Um, he has a good record of municipal service there as well, so of course he would be a great candidate for that role. And knowing these issues, because he's been through it as second selectman, um, he could uh, speak to them pretty well. Are these the Wallingford numbers coming in? Yes. Because yes. I, I yes. got a text that uh, Le that Lenny uh, <laughs> won uh, Wallingford by yeah, twenty two by wow. two thousand six hundred votes. Len Fasano in Wallingford. No, these 1, numbers are reversed. Nope, those numbers are wrong. So, oh, I think is that symbol maybe mean that? What yeah. symbol? Wait a minute. You know what? We better we better check well, before we what get I'm too far. What I'm, hearing, yeah. from, what I'm okay. hearing from my headquarters is that uh, Lenny won Wallingford by over two thousand votes. So what's coming well, up on the, the what's coming up on the screen right there says that Steve no, won by eleven hundred votes. The same yeah, which Steve didn't win Wallingford by eleven hundred votes based on what I'm hearing from okay. headquarters. It, it's good to have someone list. with a, a, a really good <laughs> cell phone link to with what's a, happening. <laughs> in that respect. Yeah, with a busy iPhone. And also, we were discussing absentee ballots earlier. Um, Lenny won absentee ballots in North Haven, 376 over Steve to 313, which again, that is pretty close. I mean, there was a very concerted effort with McMahon's money to get Republican absentee ballots, 
And you know, you see a number like this in North Haven, where you know Steve only lacked 60 absentee ballots, and that's on the state senate race. And yet, you see why statewide, you can probably make that call for Chris Murphy. We're going to go back to Marcus Haroon reporting from the Democratic headquarters. The party has heated up at Democratic headquarters. Now we're here with Mary Mashinsky. She just, they just announced that she won. We'd like to congratulate you. Thank you. Um, so first off, are you happy? Are you excited that you just won? Very happy. Very happy. Uh, pleased that the turnout, turnout was great today. And pleased to be real So uh, I'm sure it looks like you're really bundled up. You were outside, you were at the polls today? Yeah. Yeah, rotate around the polls, and if you're out, um, the candidates usually stay outside the polls with their volunteers, and if you do that all day, you have to have the four layers, you know, the, the uh, cuddle duds, and a wool sweater, and another wool sweater, and a coat, and a hat, and mittens, and boots, the full, the full thing. <laughs> And uh, could you tell me a little bit about how the experience was today? Did you meet any interesting people, any good stories from yeah, today? Yeah, I met, I, I, I met some people who I had done case work for, and they updated me on their case. Okay. Uh, they had family members that needed help, and uh, I had met with them uh, privately and tried to work something out for their family members, and they told me what was going on with that. I had some new cases come in. Um, job dislocation people that they're older folks and they need to be retrained to do something different and I was talking to them about retraining and you know not to give up hope because they can uh, go to community college get a new certificate and they'll be trained for something else and be able to get a job so I was trying to uh, reinforce that it's possible to get retrained no matter what your age and you can get another career you know, people in, in the U.S. Bay, they go through seven different careers, and uh, that's the way it is today, you know, you stay with the same company all your whole life anyway. So, so I, was, I was just bucking them up, and so I was uh, taking the casework on the phone, which I had in my pocket, and uh, so I didn't have, nothing, didn't have anything to write on, so I was just taking the casework on the phone. And, uh, promising them I deal with it. You've been working while you're at the polls? <laughs> well, I mean, it's faster to do it then while, while it's in my mind than try to remember later. So uh, I just call myself and I give the case information. Okay. I, t I tell them I'll help them with it later. And any thoughts on the Murphy-McMahon race from today? No, uh, you have a total a final on that? Uh, Murphy's definitely won. ABC in? News was reporting that we haven't confirmed that yet, but that is what they were just. Well, if it's true, I'm I'm <laughs> real thrilled, I'm really thrilled. I, I was hoping that a person could not just purchase a seat. I was just really hoping that Connecticut folks were smart enough that that would not happen. And if that's if that's the case, I'm just thrilled. Well, we're here with Mary Mashinsky. Thank you very much for your Thank time. You. Now we have the Wallingford totals, and these are the correct wall Wallingford. No, they're they're still. Yeah, live TV is awesome. Yeah, yeah. And th those okay. were still incorrect. So read the, the, yes, correct, the correct number and ignore totals. anything you've seen on the screen. In Wallingford, Len Fasano three thousand one hundred and three, Steve Fontana one thousand nine hundred and thirty one, um, and East Haven we have Len Fasano five thousand nine hundred and ten. Uh, Steve Fontana, 4,548, and the Durham section, 571 for Fasano and 455 for Fontana, and I think you've been adding them up. Have you been adding them up? Well, you, <laughs> well then I'll fill in. What we do see from the numbers, whether they are accurate as they are, is that Lenny did win all four towns. Yeah, and I, I would never trust the journalist to do math, but <laughs> yeah, I, with, with partial numbers, it, is, it, lo it looks partial as about 11,500 for Len and uh, 10,700 for Steve. And, and again, we don't have complete numbers by any means. But I do think, you know, since Steve already did a call and concede, I, I think it's uh, clear that, you know, this is called for Lenny. Well, it looks like, ladies and gentlemen, that this could at least be 55-45 in terms of the margin of victory for Len. But again, the numbers really are not quite accurate, but it, it looks like it doesn't matter because they're well, going to come in. Because the result, the result is accurate. Right? At this yeah. point, yes. so. Well, so far we've uh, kind of uh, 
seen uh, democracy in action. We've seen a four-town state senate race. Uh, we really, in a sense, couldn't lose because uh, we had two good people in it. Right. And as you pointed out, I think uh, one of those headlines is that uh, North Haven has uh, the state senate minority leader and the state senate majority leader representing it. Uh, going back to what's ahead on that local front, does, is the well dry in Hartford? Do you think Hartford can do much more for North Haven, even with these two powerhouse people there? But, but look what Dan Moy has already done for us. I mean, the, we have an economic development investment by the state of Connecticut through Dan Malloy to develop the property on State Street. Mm -hmm. um, that's leadership. I mean, the, that's one of Dan Malloy's initiatives, the first five initiative, to bring development. And where did he bring one of those first five? He brought it to North Haven. Oh. Now, that is because of the climate in North Haven was ready to accept a business like that. We had the location available. You know, the town has been marketing it for two years. The Economic Development Commission, which I'm part of, has been working on that. Um, but when we had it ready, Dan Malloy stepped in had, with the right investment. He is taking North Haven seriously. We've got two of the great state senators, and I think economic development will continue here in town um, because we're on the radar screen as a town that's in growth. Yeah, I, I would say that there's a lot more ahead for North Haven at the state level. We've been able to forge really excellent relationships with a lot of the people at the state level beyond State Senator Len Fasano and State Rep Dave Yaccarino. There are everyday people there. The addition of Marty Looney, as we've spoken about, in the Ridge Road section in that district is going to help us tremendously. As we said earlier, you know, we've known Marty for years, and he, he cares about North Haven. His wife actually works in North Haven. I really anticipate a lot more growth here at the local level. We will have the state support like we just mentioned. But I also see us now with Marty and Len working together with Dave and myself in a position to get more grants as they become available. We had a great couple of years here on getting these steep grants and I really can see that continuing. I just want to uh, give the control room a heads up that uh, we are anticipating having a break and uh, we also anticipate that we're going to have reports coming in from Republican and Democratic headquarters. At, at last report, uh, Steve had not reached the headquarter. Yeah, Steve was taking the numbers in, in East Haven and had to get over to Wallingford. So it's going to take time for him to get there and then for the tape to get back here for, mm -hmm. for uh, play on NHTV. Um, I think they will probably have Lenny's tape sooner because he's right down the street of Fantasia. But uh, we probably will have a little bit of a wait for the tape from Steve. Okay. But yeah. I will gladly fill us in with yeah. everything wrong with Linda McMahon's campaign in the meantime. <laughs> <laughs> I think on that note, I'm going to go over to Wait, don't, 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 so leave don't leave so quickly, okay. Eric. Okay. Don't, don't start that party. <laughs> no, no, not yet. And, uh, but anyway, we will be return with more of election coverage for 2012 here on NHTV. Stay with us. Some risks are obviously not worth taking. Watch where you're going. Some aren't as obvious, but could be just as deadly, like the risk for type 2 diabetes, especially if you're over 45 or overweight. Take the diabetes risk test. It's free and takes less than a minute. Type 2 diabetes is one risk you can't afford to take. So stop diabetes before it stops you. The curfew you have imposed on me is an egregious infringement upon my social well-being and freedom. I know my rights, and you can't tell me what to do. Does every conversation with your teen turn into a debate? Call the Boystown National Hotline at 800-448-3000. Trained counselors are on call 24-7 to help with parenting problems. Tools make our lives easy. When it comes to straightening crooked teeth and jaws, orthodontists have the right tools. With two to three years of specialized education beyond dental school, they are uniquely skilled to oversee your care. Put your smile in the right hands. My husband says social drinking relaxes him, but he's not very relaxed when he comes home at night. He's always ready to pick a fight. I don't think he's an alcoholic, even though I think he drinks too much. My psychiatrist suggested I try Al-Anon Family Groups. I was surprised at how quickly I found help at Al-Anon. Are you troubled by someone's drinking? You might be surprised at what you could learn in an Al-Anon family group meeting from people just like you. Call 1-888-4-ALANON or visit alanonfamilygroups.org. In an instant, everything we know can be taken away. I'm John LaRoquette, and as an actor, I've made a career on TV and performing on the Broadway stage. But is that what matters most? 
If I was suddenly disabled and couldn't take steps, couldn't I still act? Only abilities matter. Visit Kessler Foundation on Facebook and tell us your abilities. And go to KesslerFoundation.org where only abilities matter. Welcome back. Uh, actually, you didn't go away. We did. But uh, we are pretty much finished with the, uh, the first order of business, which is finding out who won. And, and uh, uh, Steve Fontana has conceded the election to Len Fasano. And we are very, very thankful, uh, Mike Frieda, for selectman, for your Republican insights tonight. And Walt Spader is going to stay with us a little longer, continuing with the Democratic. But Mike, you're heading to Fantasia? Yes, I'm going to go to fantasy. I'd just like to say it was a great pleasure to be here this evening with Walter, with Ken, and with Teal. I really enjoy doing this election coverage, and uh, thank you for watching. Thank you. And uh, drive carefully. There may be people celebrating out there on your way and not paying as much attention to the road, perhaps. Well, uh, you're, you're a practical politician in every sense, and... Uh, you're indicating that obviously this is not the end of the road by any means for Steve Fontana, and, and he's got a number of options. Right. It, it would be a shame for the people of North Haven if it was the end, um, because again, Steve has served, has been an admirable public servant. So um, while we don't really have time to fully digest what these results mean, um, you know, I'll have a lot of conversation with him in the next couple of weeks, and we'll you know, see what the future has in store. How was his campaign organization? Is there anything you look at that you could have done differently? Again, this this was a difficult campaign because he was running against an incumbent that had been there for a while. He was not the incumbent, even though he had a record. He was not the incumbent, um, and you know Lenny had not been challenged for a while, so you know he had a lot of time out there where you know he was just not looked at like a politician by the public. You know, he was just out there at public events, you know, receiving awards for different things he has done in town and different charities he's contributed to. So he had a lot of time to, you know, build the role that, you know, he is the state senator. So it, there was a difficult hill to climb. And again, Steve has only run in North Haven. So he had to spend a lot of time getting his name recognition in East Haven and Wallingford and Durham, where Len didn't have that issue to overcome. So Steve had to spend the first few months of this campaign just on door to door to introduce himself to the people of East Haven and Wallingford. And in any cycle, people know Steve in North Haven because he's been a part of our elections for you know a decade, you know, more than a decade, you know, quite some time. Um, the people in East Haven and Wallingford didn't know who he was. So he had to spend a lot of time building up a name recognition. Um, and it takes time. It takes time to have your, the name on the ballot a few times before he starts getting recognized. So even today, he had to spend a lot of his time in those towns just so that they could learn who he was and learn about his record. And like I said earlier, the only mailing I sent out from the Democratic Town Committee was that positive piece to mm -hmm. let people know who Steve was, because it's was important that they knew who he was. It wouldn't it be great if this could sort of on the local level work its way up rather than trickling down so that we could work it, its way up to DC because um, it, there seems to be such intransigence on the national level. Yeah, well, we're going to you know, find out probably even more about the national level tonight as we're trying to see what happens you know, state by state in the o Obama Romney uh, campaign. The It's very important to me that candidates run positive campaigns on a local level. It should be about what you've done for the town and what you can do for the town. It shouldn't be about tearing down the other person. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think that that just causes rifts that can't be rebuilt. You know, um, and you know, Mike and I, you know, we did throw a couple things back at each other, you know, during the course of the night. But nonetheless, you know, we've known how to work with that. And you know, there's nothing personal when you know, even before we went on air, I gave him a Barack Obama sticker because his <laughs> candidate, Linda McMahon, endorsed Barack Obama in the past week. So, you know, I wanted to just make sure that, you know, he had an Obama sticker. You know, there are things you do that are, you know, aren't personal, mm -hmm. you know. And when politics does get personal, which is a lot of what happened in this U.S. Senate race, it turns off the electorate. Exactly. As I was at the polls today, 
there was an enthusiasm gap. Enthusiasm. All right, a gap in the enthusiasm <laughs> in the Republican poll standards that were out there today. And you saw a lot of people with their Fasano signs. Dave was out there aggressively. There wasn't a lot of Linda excitement on the Republican side. And I think it's because of the type of campaign she ran, you know, really didn't get that buy-in from the base. And as you said, top down, does it come top down? You know, she hadn't served on local boards. Mm -hmm. She hadn't put her time in in the trenches and just kind of felt, I can buy this. And if I spread money around, it'll just make people happy. Well, it didn't when they realized that the campaign they bought into for her or they bought from her wasn't what they wanted to be sold. Um, I think you saw this from state Republicans around the state tonight and in the last couple of weeks. We're like, how did we endorse a candidate that is endorsing the Democratic candidate for president? You know, what did we get when we got this candidate? And I think you saw the gap of that enthusiasm in the hardcore base Republicans out at the polls tonight. We're like, we can't be comfortable with this. We can't be comfortable with the type of campaign mm -hmm. she just ran. And so I do think there needs to be more of a positive step right down at this base. And that's the type of candidates we should be looking for in our congressional and our statewide offices. How much of North Haven does uh, Martin Looney represent in terms of uh, the number of residents or voters? I believe it's about 3,000 voters. Uh, so it's about a third of Ridge Road District. So it's mm -hmm. not a large portion. But nonetheless, it is one of his towns. And it's now. all of New. He's all of New Haven. He's not all of New Haven. Tony Harp has part of New Haven oh, with okay. West Haven, right. and yes. it's most. I think it's mostly Hamden. Joe Crisco has a portion of Hamden. Okay. So um, his towns are largely New Haven, New Haven. Uh, most of Hamden, and a sliver of New Haven. And he just needed those three thousand voters to even out his district, and that's. There is a difference between representing. Uh, I don't know. You're a suburb versus uh, an urban city, uh, and, and yet uh, he has the intellectual capabilities, it seems, to deal with that as if, uh, you know, he's been doing it all along. Well, he's done it well, you know, with how he handles Hamden, how he handles New Haven. Um, and again, even as he's out there campaigning today, you know, he's making calls into other districts and seeing how other state senators are doing. He, in his role as majority leader, he's involved in a lot of different portions of Connecticut and a lot of different districts of Connecticut and is able to balance those concerns um, for urban versus uh, suburb. And I do think that, you know, he will put the interests of North Haven as one of the districts that he now represents, uh -huh. you know, high on his priority list. Um, again, knowing that this change was coming and knowing that he was now going to be a North Haven representative once January hit. You know, he's already been taking the steps. He's already been uh, getting involved in different commissions in town and just, you know, getting involved in the community. And um, it, it was great to see him. I mean, I've worked with him for years, you know, through New Haven, but it was great to see him now at North Haven events and be taking a more active role in our community. You uh, mentioned that among the local issues we can see coming our way in the, in the year ahead, as we focus on uh, the first electman race, the middle school. What what is going to be the bottom line on that? What is it that North Haven's going to have to decide? Well, they're going to have to decide if uh, renovation or, you know, new construction is probably you know, not in the... Status quo uh, yeah, is not an option. Status quo is not an option. And is it best to improve where it is or use a site like Gateway or some other option that might be out there? And the financial burden is going to be large. You know, so how is it going to be bonded? You know, Again, now we've got a leadership team in Hartford, you know, that's good for bonding and getting good rates for municipalities. So, I mean, you know, we, we do have a team that's going to be able to get us assistance from the state to try and not have much of the burden go to the taxpayers. But it is a concern. Uh, I have not fully read all the reports. Um, but it is a concern coming very quickly that the uh, middle school needs attention. I remember uh, uh, Hamden faced the, whether to build a new high school or renovate the one they had. And when they looked at the middle school, that, that became a renovation. I mean, at some point, the, the dollars get really close. And well, the dollars get close, and it's also what kind of state funding is available for mm -hmm. those projects at the time. I, I think the current rate is a 70% reimbursement you know, from the state. Um, and so that's why, you know, in this economy, you see places like West Haven and New Haven building schools because of the amount that's being covered by state funds and federal grants and federal work programs. So there are, you know, funds that are out there, but how that 
mix is going to come in is still to be seen. What other development uh, concerns are there? I mean, everybody's for keeping taxes lower and bringing business in and creating jobs, but what's the other side of that? Well, the other side, you know, um, I do now serve on the Economic Development Commission, and one of the things I did criticize Mike when I sat here for two years ago was throwing out too many things that weren't coming to reality. Um, and I, I know he has not done a lot of that in the past two years, and that said, I also, the things that I've been involved with, you know, as far as what developments are coming into town, when things are not signed signatures, yeah, it's tough to throw them out there and say, hey, here's what's happening. I mean, the medical epicenter that's happening down on uh, the southern portion, I mean, uh -huh. the developments are in place and it's coming along. You know, Dan Malloy coming in and helping us out on State Street and finally finding a tenant for the old Quebecor building is going to be a major boon to the town of North Haven. Um, and I thank the governor for that. But, Gentlemen, yeah. we have a uh, report coming in from Democratic headquarters from Marcus Haroon right now. At Democratic headquarters, we've heard of some victories tonight. Now we are here with Jason Zandri, the Democratic counselor for one Wallingford. Of the, yeah, one of Wallingford's Democrat town councilors. And uh, so just tell me what you're feeling, what the results that we've heard so far. Well, as you can hear over there, we're really excited. We're really excited that our, all of our incumbents have been able to re-win their seats here in Wallingford. We were pushing very hard for Steve Fontana here in Wallingford. Obviously, it's a multi-town district, so we're still waiting on the results from other towns to find out how Steve did. But what Mary Mashinsky and Mary Fritz, they both made it back in. We heard on the news that Chris Murphy took the state. They projected him as the winner. He took Wallingford as well. So we're really happy. All the hard work has paid off, and, and we couldn't be happier. And uh, which one of the races that did you work on, uh, did you put most effort into? I probably helped Steve Fontana the most, and most of my work that I did with him was getting the presence up on the, the websites and up on the blogs and pushing his information. Because of my job in New York City, I don't have much time during the evenings to come out and help them out with the phone banks or on the weekends I'm spending time with my kids. My, my son's got baseball, so I don't have that much opportunity to do a lot of legwork. So that was the type of work that I ended up doing for him. And with Mr. Fontana's campaign, did you see the debate? Yeah, actually, we there were debates here in town by the uh, League of Women Voters, and I actually pulled all the video from that with the help of government TV here in Wallingford. I had those posted up on our blog as well. So I did see the debates. I think he did very well. Uh, it's very hard to beat any incumbent, but I think, you know, again, we don't know the results from the other two towns, but I think he did a fantastic job knocking on doors and reaching out to people. And in that state senate race, it seemed like that de that debate was one of the more exciting ones. They, for a state senate debate, it, it got pretty heated. Yeah, well, I mean, when you've got different sets of opinions and different styles of how you think things should be done, that's what's going to happen. But, I mean, I think the best idea that you can go with from something like that is understanding that in the end, whoever is elected is our representative and they work for both sides. And uh, which one of Steve's policies do you think was uh, the most important one, the main one? That we're talking about? I think his his ability to champion the everyday people, th those those things that, that he came out with, working families and wanted to make sure that you know schools were taken care of at the state level, that there weren't any unfunded mandates, those are the types of things I think we have to be paying attention in Hartford and pushing down. Well, Mr. Zandri, thank you very much. Thank I you for your time. For your time. Okay, go for it. Well, we've got a couple of things going on at this point. We're we're awaiting uh, Len Fasano and and Steve Fontana, sort of the closing remarks, and uh, we're waiting for that. They'll be on their way shortly, and uh, also uh, the projections for uh, Murphy over McMahon apparently were based on exit polls, and at this point, nobody can really challenge them other than. Uh, when all the votes are in, then you can challenge the results of the exit poll. And you wanted to comment further, Walt, on uh, just how the Murphy-McMahon thing may have played out in terms of the total electorate. Right. Well, well I'm seeing just just from what I what I've seen, you know, it is based on exit polls, but the numbers look like it's going to be a clear Murphy victory. I mean, New Haven, from what I'm seeing, about 46,000 people came out to vote uh, when we were talking here two years ago. The turnout in New Haven was 28,000, okay. and New Haven is what turned the Malloy election two years ago. So seeing that many more votes out in New Haven, um, the Bridgeport turnouts are, are looking very good. I mean, there was over 2,000 absentee ballots as of yesterday. I think I said that earlier, and what I'm getting in. So I do think the 
since those are where two of the largest pluralities came out for Dan Malloy two years ago, they're going to be stronger this year for Murphy. I do think that's why they're making that call in that uh, in that race. Does Murphy uh, indicate an Obama coattail then? Well, uh, or that, is it the other way around? Well, no, no, no. I, Obama was going to be the clear victor in Connecticut, uh, without question. His, his policies fit the people of Connecticut, and he's done an excellent job in his first four years. You know, we gave Bush eight years to make the mess. We got to give Obama eight years to clean it up. But with the Mur the Murphy McMahon race was just a totally unique in animal in and of itself. When you have a Republican state senate candidate campaigning to say vote for the Democratic president. So it was its own unique race, and I don't think there's really a coattails issue there. I think Murphy stood up on his own on the issues. You know, when you saw the debates, you could clearly see that Murphy was ready to be a U.S. senator, and McMahon just had no idea what the job entailed. So I don't think there was coattails. I think he really did stand up on his own. How do you see the loss of seniority that Connecticut has endured with? Uh, uh, Chris Dodd ending his career and Joe Lieberman ending his career. Well, in the Senate, the loss of seniority, it, it's important. Um, Dick Blumenthal has major respect, though, amongst the Democratic establishment, you know, in Washington and even the Republican establishment. He has a record before him of public service, and he is well respected on all the um, areas that he sits in. Um, and we have to remember on the congressional level, We've got Rosa, you know, who is the most senior female uh, congresswoman. And we have John Larson, who is, you know, quickly going up the ranks as well, representing uh, Connecticut. I'm very curious. We haven't gotten any results yet on what's happening in the 5th District um, with Estee versus Rohrbach. And, you know, that's going to be important to the future of Connecticut as well, who's going to be representing the 5th District there. But uh, I think with our Connecticut congressional delegation being led by Rosa and with John Larson and, and um, our other representatives there all the way to Chris Murphy, uh, we are well positioned here in Connecticut. Do you think that the enthusiasm grew as we got closer to this date? Because for there, people were saying for a while there just didn't seem to be much enthusiasm on the Democratic side. Well, it's hard for me to say that because, you know, I was really involved intimately in the campaign. So where I was working, I was only dealing with people who were enthusiastic. But you could see in the public, they really, all they had heard about the campaign was what Linda was saying about it. And so it was hard for Chris Murphy to get his message out there because he was defined by Linda. So when that occurred, it was it was a different type of campaign where he then had to spend all of his money and what was raised on these new redefining ads and response ads rather than proactive get mm -hmm. the message out ads. So less money was put into the typical rallies and types of things that you would do to rally the base. You know, and then when he gets Bill Clinton to come in last Sunday, it's on the eve of a storm, so he doesn't get the media hit he would have mm -hmm. gotten when uh, Bill Clinton came. But what the campaign did, like for instance, when Bill Clinton came, and they had to have it at the Palace Theater, the seating was limited, but they went to people like me and um, Gene Rocco in East Haven, who's the town chair there, and said, okay, who in your town committees has been working hard for the campaign? And if they get to go see this Bill Clinton event, wow. it's going to help them mm -hmm. spend the next yeah. week more motivated out there. So they went to the people who were working in the campaign and said, hey, here's the tickets to go see Bill Clinton. You give it to people that's reward going to workers, yeah. reward the workers. Because it, it, when it became very limited, when Secret Service said, no, mm -hmm. we're cutting it off, it's going to be at the Palace Theater, and we got to start it earlier, and he's got to get on a plane before the storm hits, you know, you want to get the enthusiasm going. And that's where we're, we're talking about college students. Those are the type of events you'd like to send those mm -hmm. people to. But when they just, it's important to go back to your students and say, find out who your local leaders are. Get involved. Because when they start getting involved and they start understanding the process more, that's when they're going to stay with it. The reason I'm sitting here as a town chair today is because I started getting, I got on the Shelton Democratic Town Committee, you know, when I was mm -hmm. just able to vote at 18, you know, and, and I was a kid there. But I started seeing these campaigns from the inside, and I started even when I was, you know, my daughter's age now, with lawn signs and with issues like that. And it gets you more excited, it gets you more involved, and you understand your civics better. And then you understand what the electoral college is and all the mm -hmm. other issues that come in down the line. 
but if it's just the act of I'm going to show up to vote once every two or four years, you don't have that invested interest in it. We have a report now from Joe Villante from Republican headquarters. Joe Villante again back at Republican headquarters. I have the winner here, Len Pisano. Congratulations. Let me Thank be you, the Joe. first to congratulate you. Thank you very much. Um, I appreciate it. Yeah. Thank you so much. Uh, I know you worked hard. You, you, you know, I had a whole team. It wasn't just me. It was so many people put the uh, lawn, signs on their lawns who went out there and stood in the cold. There are just so many people to thank. The people believe in me in my district, and it's always overwhelming to me when I get elected. I just feel so... Now excited. you're being modest again, Lenny. No, you, did a, you did a lot of work, Lenny. You were out there. I was out there, but, you know, it's people that make an election. Yes. It's not one person. It's not one you person. You did a wonderful job. But anyway, I want to congratulate you again. Thank you, Joe. And, uh, Well, uh, what do you think? Len Fasano looks pretty statesmanlike there, in a subdued way. Yeah, well, you know, he did run against someone that he worked with for a number of years. So you're not going to, you know, brag, mm -hmm. jump up and down. And plus, his other candidates at the top of the ticket were not successful. So, you know, he, he's in a room with the unsuccessful congressional candidate and the top of his ticket you know, did not uh, succeed in the way that they hoped it would. So, you know, he did strike the right tone. And, and I do think that uh, we're going to have, you know, two years where um, you know, Lenny's going to continue the work he's done for the town of North Haven. What's your relationship with Chris Murphy? And if he uh, does become the United States Senator, what, what can you tell us about him and, and what is he likely to look toward this part of the state as? You know, well, he lives in Cheshire, which is just right up the street. Um, my first interaction with Chris Murphy is when I was the communication director for the state Democratic Party. You know, he's only one year older than I am. Oh, um, you he, look so much younger. <laughs> yeah, I've got a lot more grades than when we did the show <laughs> two years ago. The, um, yeah, it, w he was working in, uh, I think it was 1996, for uh, the campaign of Charlotte Koskoff against Nancy Johnson. Mm. You know, if you remember that race, and I think that was one of his early campaigns that he was working on as a campaign manager. Not a lot of people were giving Charlotte a lot of chance to win that race, so she relied on a good network of volunteers, and Chris came up through that network of someone who was working in his local town committee. I think he lived in Southington at the time, and they put him in a leadership role in that campaign. In that campaign, he got to go around the 6th District, meet the different leaders in the 6th District, and then when a state Senate seat opened up, you know, he ran. and. Um, He's been one of those guys, as I just said earlier, involved with campaigns at a young age, learning the process, learning the players, learning the people in the different communities. And when you're out there, especially in that situation in the 6th District where he was at the time, and we don't even have a 6th District right. anymore in Connecticut. That was one of the redistricted congressional seats 12 years ago. But when you're out working in those local communities, you get to learn more of the issues. and. Again, when you're talking to your students at Quinnipiac, I mean, when you start getting involved, it motivates you to be more involved, and you see the positive impact of what you're doing can have in people's lives in real time, and it makes you want to do more. And he's been one of those guys that always wanted to do more, mm. and I think he's going to be a great U.S. Senator. He's not going to forget, you know, this area of the state because he represented the fifth at one point. He's our neighbor in Cheshire. And um, maybe you can redistrict and bring that into the 34th. Well, <laughs> <laughs> I think the no. fifth district will be hoping that they we get redistricted into their district mm -hmm. uh, with the Sesti Rohrbach race tonight. Uh, and you know, Joe Courtney has in the second district. He has um, he's predicted the winner in that district. So that's another congressman who was working hard with you know on Murphy's campaign. The second district was an area that uh, Lyndon needed a strong showing by the Republican challenger to Courtney, because uh, it's one of those districts which, you know, what Janet Peckinpah got like hundred thousand votes out of there. So it showed that someone that doesn't really know the political process <laughs> over the years can still get some votes in that yeah. district. But uh, you know, it's like uh, when you talk about red states and blue states. New England is a huge blue state. It is. I mean, you know, the Republicans from New England are more moderate Republicans, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. and they're, um, it ends up being that the representatives that come out of this district, uh, out of this area, all of New England, you know, the Democratic candidates who have come forward have more fit the goals of the voters in the district because 
the Tea Party influence in the Republican Party over the past few years has made their candidates move more to the right. Uh -huh. And so by taking extreme positions in primaries, it has made it harder for those candidates to be viable in a general election. And so this fringe group of the Republican Party on a state and regional basis has been kind of calling the shots internally and that's been causing some problems for those candidates when they try to be viable in a general election. I remember some decades back when the party lever was removed there were people saying you know how are the parties going to be able to do what they're doing but the ultimate result has been ticket splitting has been uh, ev everybody knows how to do it there was a time where you actually had to teach people that and in, in addition I think uh, the fact that in, in if I had the numbers right in North Haven a uh, quarter of the voters are Republican a quarter of the reporters the voters are Democrat and half are the independents and you you can't win without the uh, the independents so and they don't have a chairman well they don't and, and they're not technically independents they're unaffiliated because mm -hmm. the independents as you know Linda let everyone know is its own party the numbers actually for the, going into this election uh, in North Haven there were 3,825 registered Democrats 3,776 registered Republicans, 62 members of other parties, but 7,981 unaffiliated voters. Now, as you've seen from election to election here in North Haven, it goes different ways. In 2010, Foley had more votes than Malloy, so the Republican ended up ahead in that race. But Blumenthal had more votes than McMahon in the same election. So there was ticket splitting right there. It hasn't really been a problem. I mean, it still comes down to parties presenting to the electorate the best candidates that can handle those jobs, that represent the interests and needs and values of the community. And North Haven voters, those that unaffiliated block, which is the most important block, it is the majority block. Um, of course, I encourage them to get involved in the parties because that's my job as Democratic Town Chair. And I'd like to have your voice in the party, but we are presenting candidates from both sides that we hope appeal to the town as a whole. Has that always been the way it is in North Haven? I didn't pull a lot of historical data actually. I, um, I, do, I do have some of it probably for the past 10 years. But it's always, the Republicans have had the lead in North Haven for a number of years. It's only been the last uh, four years that the Democrats have taken a slight lead, but wrote. it's not really a marginal lead. It's, it's mm -hmm. you know, 50 voters mm -hmm. and it changes all times as people move in and out. So the parties are kind of equal. Our unaffiliated tend to lean Republican just looking at polling data. We, we just received uh, our menu coming up and uh, the, the order of the people we'll be hearing from uh, as the evening progresses here is Len Fasano, Dave Iaccarino, uh, the congressional candidate Winsley who uh, has lost to Rosa DeLauro and then uh, Iaccarino again and uh, where is Steve Fontana? Do you have any uh, insights? Did he, did he make it to? <laughs> yes, no, uh, Steve gave his speech probably about 20 minutes ago in Wallingford um, at the Italian American Club. Mm -hmm. uh, NHTV was taping it, and I believe that tape's on the way here, so you know, it should be here probably close to the end of uh, this tape, if, but we'll talk a few minutes in between while they load yeah. the tape up. And uh, what do you do to, do you try in the next year or two to get some of those unaffiliated into the Democratic Party specifically or is this just the way business is done well, here? No, we are constantly doing that. I mean, this year the Republicans had a much more successful job doing that because the importance of being a member of a party is to vote in the party primary to have a say in who those candidates are. I mean, this year the Republicans had a choice between Linda McMahon and uh, Chris Shays. In order to vote in that primary, you had to register with one of those parties. So there are registration drives that take place at that time. The race between Murphy and Susan Bice, which wasn't as contested as the Linda McMahon one, so while we also tried to register candidates, in the next four years, the importance of joining a party are going to be even more important. I do project that Barack Obama is going to win tonight, but um, what's going to happen in four years is we're going to have open seating on Democratic and Republican side for the presidential election. And you need to be registered with a party to vote in those presidential primaries. So people that complain are these are the best candidates that can that you guys can give us. Well it comes down to those primaries and joining the party, participating in the primaries, voting in the primaries, you know, has a good say in who those candidates are going to be. So once Barack Obama enters his second term, you know, in January, you know, there's going to be an open 
time on the Democratic and Republican side. You'll look forward to a lot more ads on TVs, a lot more debates on you know, MSNBC and CNN with you know, scores of candidates across the table. But it's going to be very important because if you want to vote in those uh, primaries and determine who those candidates are going to be on the ballot, you're going to have to join a party. You know, that's true. But some of the, uh, and I've heard the Republicans say it also, the long primary season did not benefit any of the Republican candidates. Well, it certainly didn't benefit the Republican candidates. It, it benefited Barack Obama because it gave the opportunity for these candidates to just take positions diametrically opposed to each other, debate to debate, just because they're trying to play to whatever audience they were in front of that day. Um, the long primary season is not good for candidates. It is good for the public because it does whittle out a lot of these candidates. It is tiresome, though. There's not really a way to shorten it. It's just it costs so much to run a presidential campaign. It takes a long time to raise the money. You have to get in early if you're going to be a viable candidate. So you have to start raising money early. You can't sit back and just you know wait till five, six months before an election to announce yourself. Um, so it does take years of network building, of going to the target battleground states where one state has a straw poll, one state has you know caucuses. You know, qualifying in each of those states. You have to sometimes a year before the presidential election, you're still already qualifying for primaries. So if you want to get ready at that point, you have to already have been a candidate working those states, building an organization for eight, nine months. So I don't see a way to really end how long the presidential campaigns go at this time. We're about to move from, oh, I don't know what, uh, talking about things that uh, are going on out of our sight. We're actually now going to see Len Fasano's victory speech at Republican headquarters. If I could have everyone's attention, please. If I could have everyone's attention. First of all, uh, there's so many things I'd, I'd like to say. First of all, I want to introduce my wife, Jill, my daughter, Kristen, and my mom. Um, my sister is here. Where's Val? Val's here. My sister is here someplace. Val, come on up if you're here. Um, you know, you don't win an election by yourself. You win an election with so many people. And I had such a terrific team in East Haven. I had a terrific team in North Haven. I had a terrific team uh, led by my campaign manager, Bob Parisi, uh, in Wallingford, who's been with me yeah. since day one. And he's been one of, the, one of the biggest supporters of mine since I first entered the race. And I sincerely mean if it wasn't for Bob, I wouldn't have had a chance of, of even winning the first race, Bob. You know how much you mean to me in my election. Thank you so much. We had a great team out in Durham, the new town we picked up. What won this election was the outpouring of support from friends, relatives, and neighbors. All the lawn signs that went up, all the support of standing at the polls, talking to people over coffee, talking to people at lunch and dinner about the message we had. And I'm always overwhelmed when I win an election because I just feel that people, I, I'm so honored by, by being a state senator, and I'm so honored to serve in that chair, which I only have for a short period of, of history. And I know that, but I am just so, so honored. I also have to tell you that Dave Yaccarino has been an absolutely tremendous yeah. supporter of mine. His team has meant so much to me. I mean, Dave did not have an opponent, but he walked. Dave did not have an opponent, but he pressed me. Dave did not have an opponent, but he was out there telling people, vote for me, but you got to vote for Len, too. And I mean, you just don't see that in politics. but. When it comes to Dave, he's not a politician. He's a regular guy who just does a great, great job for the town of North Haven. There's so many people to thank, and you make a mistake when you thank a lot of people. But there are a few people I have to point out as I point out, Bob. Chris Fletcher, a guy who has just been with me all the time, putting up with, with me, putting up with my anxiety, putting up with the pressure I put on him. I can't thank him enough, Fletch. You did such a great, great job. Christine Mulligan, my secretary, I don't know where she is, but she's here someplace over there. Christine, thank you so much. 
Mary Ann, Laurie, and Sue in, in, in East Haven. I mean, the list just goes, thank you guys. And where's Teddy? Where's Teddy? Teddy in the back there yelling out the numbers, the driver, Teddy. I can't thank you guys enough. But listen, it's a great victory. We are going to change this state. We have had enough. It's time we lower taxes. It's time we bring jobs back. Get the unemployment down below 9%. It's time we get small businesses moving. It's time we think of the people and stop growing government. And we need to do that. Now, this election, from what I'm seeing on some numbers, we're picking up a few seats in the Senate, and that's where the fight is. They picked up a lot of seats in the House, and that's a great job for folks like Dave and Larry Kefaro, but we're picking up seats in the Senate. We are going to put it to it because let me tell you, we can not let the state of Connecticut die. We cannot let, get it, let it be buried by high taxes and unemployment. We need to change this around. We can do it. It's going to take the people in this room to get busy in two years when we change the course of history in the state. Once again, I thank you so much. And now let me introduce the guy I have tremendous respect for, Representative Dave Yaccarino. Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, it's been such a pleasure working for the people of North Haven and Len Fasano, the Senator Fasano. I help Len like I would help anybody that works as hard as Len. He's done so much for our town and for our state, and that's what drove me. I would never have done that, but he's such a good person. He's done such a great job. For everybody out there from my campaign uh, committee, Frank, John, Jimmy, uh, I can't thank you enough. Um, Ben, my treasurer. I have my campaign manager and my treasurer are Democrats. And like Len and myself, we represent all the people in North Haven. Yes, we're Republicans, but our job is to represent people. And that's what I strive to do every day while I'm in Hartford. Just finished my first term, and I've been fortunate not to have an opponent. But saying that, you don't take it lightly. You always have to work, and you have to get up there and listen to one another. And that's what we do. That's what a person, when you're in this position, you have to listen to all the people. Like I said, I'll say it over and over. I say it in Hartford, and I'll say it in town. You have to listen to people, and that's how you do a better job. But I want to thank everybody. My mom's here, my daughter, my son Dave's at graduate school. He should be here any minute. My sister law Tanya, I love you very much. Uh, I wish more people were here, you know, as far as family, but it's people were spread out all over the place. You didn't have an opponent. I didn't have an opponent. <laughs> I know, I, I heard that all that. <clears throat> but, uh, but we have a serious problem in our state. We do have to pick up seats in the House in the Senate. And we will pick up some seats in both, both uh, houses, the Senate and, and uh, on our house. But we have to. We can't have do what we did two years ago, have the largest tax increase in the history of our state. And we're still in a deficit. We're running out of money to op operate on a daily basis. We lost our property tax exemption two years ago for families, full exemption. We need to reinstate that. But we need people around the state to listen. Not just because we're nice guys or nice women, but people, what we do, what we do, we should follow what we do. And I've always said that federal politicians are great, but what we do is so critically important. And on a daily basis and a monthly basis, you, follow, you should follow what we do. It's an honor serving the people of North Haven, Connecticut. It's an honor working with Len Pisano. I've learned so much from Len. I've learned a lot from our first selectman. But really, Len, it's just, it's just been a pleasure. And I, I did it from, from my heart. And uh, I want to thank everybody and pass it to Mike Ross. Just a few more things. Town committees. Anybody here? I know people are here from Wallingford, North Haven, East Haven, and Durham. Look, town committees are critical to any election. And I can't express what town committees have done in my election. Without the hard work of the chairs and the members, you can't win an election. If you want to make a difference and you want to make a change, get involved with your town committees because that's where it begins. Now, next thing I'd like to do, I want to bring up a gentleman who I consider is just an uh, uh, unbelievable guy. He's out there running for Congress, who's done a great job. And I want him to address you as we still wait for some of those numbers to come in, because he is a classy, classy individual and has a very good message. Ladies and gentlemen, Wayne Winsley. <laughs> First of all, let me just start by saying, not quite conceding yet. We're still counting votes, so I'm going to wait a minute. Yeah. But I want to say this, first of all. Thank you, one and all, for all the support 
and the hard work that you've all put in for, to help this campaign. Because let me tell you, some people out there may have given up on Connecticut's third congressional district. I'm not one of them. Because I know that for every one of you in this room, there are more and more of you out there, more and more people just like you out there who feel exactly how you feel, that taxes are too high, that our government, our country is headed in the wrong direction, and we've got to turn it back and pull it back the other way. And guess what, folks? If nothing else, a lot more people now know the answer to the question, who is Wayne Winslet? Yeah. <laughs> so let not your heart be troubled. We're not going anywhere. And uh, we're not giving up because I am not going to give up on the people of this district. I'm not giving up on the people of my state. I am not giving up on my country. I'm not going anywhere. And guess what, folks? We are going to do this. Even if it's not tonight, it'll be another night. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you. I did forget a few people that it's... Uh... Well, that's uh, what's going on tonight at the Republican headquarters. And uh, we're now going to bring you Steve Fontana's speech from Democratic headquarters. You know, first and foremost, I did uh, call my opponent, Senator Fasano, to concede. He was very gracious in accepting my call, and I congratulate him on uh, his effort. Um, what I'd like to do is uh, thank a number of people and offer a few comments. The first is that there are a lot of people that I really need to thank, because this really is a team effort. It has been a team effort the entire time. And I'd be remiss if I didn't acknowledge all the people who worked so hard on my behalf and on behalf of this campaign. First, I'd like to thank my dad, Al Fontana, and my stepmother, Mary Ann Fontana, for their love and support throughout this process. I could not have done it without them. And time and time again, when I needed something, they were there for me. They've always been there for me, and I want to thank them from the bottom of my heart uh, for their love and support uh, throughout this process. I'd also like to thank my campaign team, uh, especially Patrick Romano and Russell uh, Fall, as well as Connor Pfeiffer and all of the canvassers who worked on my behalf. Uh, they put 110% into this race, uh, and it could not have gone as well as it did without their help. So I want to thank them for everything that they invested in this campaign and for all their support throughout the process. I'd also like to thank my finance team, Sarah Zies and Tessa Marquis, for all the great work they did. Uh, I could not have done it without them. Uh, they kept an eye like a hawk on all the money and made sure everything worked out. And again, they were tremendous in this process, especially early on. And in being the first campaign, not just the first Senate campaign, but the first campaign period to qualify for public financing. Uh, and in each town, I'd like to thank a number of people who are critical to my effort. In Durham, I'd like to thank Chairman Dee Dee Levy, along with Karen Cheney, Elmer Clark, Betty Long, and Bob Fulton. In North Haven, I'd like to thank Walt Spader, Janet McCarty, Fran Bartlett, Pat Carter, Ron Smoko, Sue Hoffman, Kim Carlin, Pam Sletton, Gary Kanopka, Patty Jackson Marshall, Letty McFedrin, and Joe Anastasia. In East Haven, I'd like to thank Chairman Gene Rocco, along with Carol Scalise, Frank and Judy Capone, Andy Esposito, Danny Hoff, State Representative James Albus, and State Representative Roland Lamar of New Haven, along with Jack and Sue Stacy, Sam Giglio and Elena Quinto. Finally, in the great town of Wallingford, I'd like to thank, uh, first off, Chairman Vinny Avalone. No one could ask for a more supportive town chairman. I really am very pleased by his support and thankful for it along with Sam Carmody, Debbie Reynolds, Pat Dorenzo, Bill Comerford, Pete Guvea, Jason Zandri, Bill Nolan, Amelia Mena Erdman, State Representative Mary Mashinsky, Pat Bentley, Dave Leonardo, and Kathy Avery. 
Finally, I'd like to thank my friends at the Communication Workers of America, Bill Henderson and Jason Riccio, and Matt Wagner of Fairfield, who volunteered on my campaign. I'd like to thank everybody who gave me water when I was walking door to door, especially this past summer. Uh, and I'd like to thank everybody who contributed to my campaign, put up a lawn sign, wrote a letter to the editor, or made phone calls on my behalf. But finally, what I'd like to do is thank all of the voters of Wallingford, East Haven, North Haven, and Durham, who spoke with me as I went door to door on this campaign over the past six months. They really were very responsive, appreciative, and I believe appreciated and believed in the message that I was sending, which says it's time that we rebuild the middle class, and we do that by electing people to Hartford who will make that happen. Now again, I'm disappointed in the results, but I'm convinced that the reasons that I ran for this office still remain. I ran because I believe that the voters of the 34th District wanted and deserved a real choice. But more importantly, they needed a change. They needed a change in the type of representation they have in Hartford. And I'm sorry that they won't be getting it on this occasion. But I will not be going away. These issues will not be going away. And I'll continue to fight for these issues and fight on behalf of the people of the 34th District. In conclusion, I want to thank you all very much for coming. I want to thank the voters of the 34th District who supported me and all my friends at the polls who told me that they appreciated my remaining part of the political process, getting back into the game and running for this office this year. I look forward to seeing them again down the road and I look forward to working with all of you. Thank you all very much. I'm happy to have a drink with anybody who's staying for a drink. Absolutely. Let's go. And uh, otherwise, thank you all again. Well, that wraps up our election coverage. Walt Spader, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Ken. I mean, it was a, unfortunately, we weren't able to carry the 34th Senate District for the Democrats, but it looks like it's a great night across Connecticut and the nation as Chris Murphy will join the U.S. Senate and Barack Obama will have another four years. And Teal, it's always great working with you here at NHTV. Thank you. I love being here. Thank you for inviting me. And thank you for watching. The replay will be seen in North Haven, East Haven, and Wallingford. So uh, you're invited to relive election night 2012. Bye.